Thank you, Joseph, for that introduction. I, I'm really very pleased to have a chance to talk about China to you, not because I know anything about strategic affairs or the kind of military affairs that you are experts on, but because as a historian, one can't help all this noticing that historians talk about war much more often than they talk about peace. And some works of history are pretty obsessive about uh, how, how either to fight a war or how to avoid a war or how to talk about it anyway, one way or the other. Um, Joseph talked about rising China and China already risen. Uh, actually, what interests me as a historian is the fact that in the last 200 years, what we, have, what we saw was a fall of China and then a rise. So it's fall and rise rather than rise and fall, which is what most historians talk about. And to talk about fall and rise raises many questions about how did some country that fell so rapidly from the peak of its power at about 1800 and to its weakest point, especially if you, in the, in the metrics that you can measure in economics, to its weakest point by the beginning of the 20th century, and then very painfully and gradually and with great deal of difficulty within the country, it has risen to its present position. That fall and rise story seemed to me that uh, deserves a lot of careful attention. So when I talk about China's responses to a, a changing world, I use the word plural because I think they responded to changing worlds over the last 200 years in remarkable ways, which deserve some attention. Uh, I realize that uh, most people agree, and I agree myself, China has got too much history, and uh, they're often obsessed with it themselves. But I think it's also true to say that almost anything that China does, whether today or in the past, has very much depended on their own way of learning from their own history. And this is something they are themselves conscious about, about and they talk a lot about it themselves, and write a lot about it too. So this consciousness of history leads me to say that uh, today, when we talk about what China is doing, most people would at some point or other mention, and I single this out as a partic of particular interest, the so-called Belt and Road Initiative, or OBOR as some people call it, which of course only began a few years ago when Xi Jinping uh, announced it. Uh, this is, you might, you might say, and let me use it as an example to say that this might be called the latest response to a changing world. Um, their sense of history has another element to it which I think is worth bearing in mind. There's a dimension to it which is different from what we normally regard as history. Of course, we know the word history is ambiguous. It could mean the past, but since we all know we just don't know about the past, what we know about it comes from works of history, how people write about it or remember it and tell the stories about it. So there's history as the past and history as written by various people, some of them historians, some in, out in, 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 in today's terms professional historians, but not necessarily that. Some popular historians write some excellent histories. So there's how history is written, in other words, how we see it and how we tell it. But I think there's an additional dimension to China's understanding about history. We, the, we use the same word. The word in Chinese is shi or li shi. But actually there's a third dimension. They also understand there's a thing, the past is not knowable. We believe it is there and it's in our background, but not knowable. And then what is known, which is recorded, and with, with you, you, you go through a lot of documents and you work out what is true and what is not true and so on. That is common to, to everybody. But the third dimension is that they have a concept of history as records, all the relevant and se carefully selected records that embody the governance of the state. And that is peculiar to the state. It doesn't apply to other people. It doesn't apply to social history or, or, or some of the other branches of history that one can talk of today, which is very much a professional's interest. 
but history has the whole body of records that have been preserved, chosen, selected, to preserved to in order to teach future governance uh, makers, the people who are responsible for government, that these are the things to learn from past experience, chosen for as a good examples of what should be learned, and examples where mistakes were made from which you can learn lessons. And that concept of shi is actually a whole body of knowledge. It consists of all records pertaining to governance. And it is a whole branch of, four branches of knowledge that the Chinese have traditionally, over the last 2,000 years, divided knowledge into. Um, everybody knows about the fact that the Chinese pay a lot of attention to the classics. That's understood. They ex express all the principles of what should be done, what is good, what is right and wrong, what is moral, what is not, and those are the classics. But the second body of knowledge underneath the classics is shi, which we have used the, word, used the word history. But because we use the word history, I think we sometimes misunderstand it to mean the kind of history that we expect or we uh, would like to learn about. It isn't that, because there are four branches, as I mentioned. Classics is the branch that expresses all the principles. History represents all the records that are practical, useful, and essential for good governance. And then the third body is all the knowledge that you need to know about human beings, society, the remnants. It includes religion, other philosophies other than the Confucian classics which form the basis of all the ba important principles that they believe in all the other rem remnants, all other knowledge, except classics and history, belong to the third category. And the fourth category represents the collections of writings of all kinds, creative as well as uh, simply official documents or whatever records you may have, which are representing people's use, individuals who have their ways of seeing the world or seeing their life and expressing them in collected works of their own. All of Chinese knowledge, traditionally, were broken up into these four groups. One quarter of it, in other words, would be this body I call, they call history, which all the records. And this dimension is very important to, the, to understand how Chinese think about the past. I don't pretend to know what they think about the future. I, and I'm not sure they themselves know, uh, like everybody else can be certain about the future. But what they think about the past is very much drawn from this background of understanding it as far as the state is concerned, governance is concerned, as this body of records which includes everything. Today we would say it includes all the social sciences, includes all the engineering, practical knowledge of geography, of maps, of, and, uh, and how, how, the, how the state is uh, divided, how it is run, matters of, in fact, even matters of how you control the waters, like the, uh, the rivers, the Yellow River flooding, and so on. That's part of governance, of public policy, you might say. All that will be under shi. Why I say this is important is because when you look at China's responses, invariably they have always in the past looked to the body of knowledge that they've inherited about governance for the last, at least the last 2,000 years for the imperial system. And this is what they inherited until recently. From 1800 to 1900, that period of rapid decline was to see this imperial system being challenged by a completely new system which doesn't fit in into their historical uh, knowledge of the past and the ideas of governance of the past. So you can understand why for that first hundred years they were really torn between how much they should still look to the past in the traditional way and how much they should look at the, the challenges of something completely new and very powerful and demanding their attention all the time, which came after the opium wars of uh, 1840s down to the end of the century. And they, they were torn. And this is something that you could see how the, all the elites, the top brains of the country, as it were, were obsessed with how to deal with this. How could they retain as much as possible of the traditions that they were familiar with and confident to deal with, and how much they must learn from this outside set of 
dealings and different historical outlooks, different kinds of principles about governance and so on, which do not match what they are used to. And this has been a struggle for them. In fact, one might even go so far as to say it's been a struggle for them for over 200 years. But the first 100 years in, uh, in the 19th century was the most bitter because it was, that was a time when they were absolutely paralyzed by what to do. They were very slow to respond to changes, not because they were not, not aware there was changes. Their world of change in the world was no, no worse than anybody else's. In fact, I might add, just as a footnote, that Chinese have always believed in change. One of the most basic books, as you all know, is the Book of Changes. The nearest thing to a Bible for, for most Chinese people, it was there, the most ancient book in, in China, in Chinese, is the Book of Change. And this is something that they've taken for absolutely the norm. Change is the norm. And what life is about is how you learn about, expect it, and how you prepare for it. And you expect to, to, that there will be changes all the time. So a changing world is not something that is uh, difficult for them to accept. They saw it. They saw the changes. They watched it very carefully. But how to respond to it was the problem. To respond in the ways that they were accustomed to or to actually have to think out of that box and rethink all, these, all the wisdom that they have picked up, as it were, from those centuries of body of knowledge called Shi, which each generation, each dynasty passed on uh, from one century to the other. And this paralysis was what caused them to be so slow and seemed to be so complacent and so unchanging. Because, but if you look at the actual debates going on in the, in, uh, among the literati and the elites of the, of the Qing dynasty, they were actually debating it all the time. They were not at all uh, uh, complacent. They were concerned but they did not know how to respond. To, make, to un underline the point, the contrast was Japan. Japan didn't have these burdens of, of, of uh, a historical body of governance principles that were laid down so systematically as the Chinese had. In the case of Japan, they were happy to see new ways that were different from the Chinese. They had been dominated in a way, pushed around by the Chinese for too long, always accepting that the Chinese were wiser and, and had, had understood things better for too long, and they were rather tired of that. And when the opportunity came to see the world in a different way, that the world was changing in a way that was not uh, in the text, so to speak, in the classical historical text that the Chinese provided, they were very happy and immediately learned all about it. And the two major lessons, and maybe two or three, I, w I will only underline these, these three because there's many more, but the two or three major ones. The first is very clearly the, the, the power of technology with the scientific knowledge of the from the 17th and 18th century onwards in Europe. The Chinese were aware of it because they were actually aware of it quite early when the Jesuits brought, it, brought them some of these ideas in the 17th century just that they didn't think it was of that importance that they need to change anything fundamental about the way they, th they did things. But this time round, the, for, for the Chinese saw it. They were serious because after all, they were defeated in war by better technology, better ships. Uh, only a few thousand troops were able to defeat them because they won at sea, and this was fundamental. But the, 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 the matter was, this is a new technology, they had to learn. Secondly, that industrial capitalism was something they never had. Theirs, after all, was an agrarian economy, and how to adjust an agrarian economy to the challenges of uh, this kind of commercial capitalism, which became industrial capitalism by the 19th century, was just a little bit too demanding and expected too much of them. And they were hampered by the fact a very fundamental weakness in the Chinese system was the fact that their merchants were treated so lowly. The merchants did not have a high status, unlike in Europe, where many of the merchants of London and, and Amsterdam were equals to the aristocrat aristocracy, and in fact talked business with them, and in fact collaborated and, and worked with them for centuries. In China, the distinction was so clear that the literati and the merchant 
might help each other from time to time, but the, the hierarchical relationship was very clear. The literati were way up and the merchants were way down. That prevented them from responding as a group to, to this challenge of industrial capitalism that came to the, the four, five ports that they opened up after the Opium War and then more ports after that when they had concession areas for the British and the French and later on extended to almost every other European power that came to, to Asia, including Russia and Japan. And uh, the Chinese couldn't understand that by making those concessions, what followed was it, the takeover of the agrarian economy and to totally dominated by this new commercial and industrial capitalist economy that uh, had been developed so well elsewhere. And once that economy has been taken over and the agrarian economy could not deal with it, absolute disaster for the agrarian economy and inability to catch up no, and none of the people were there ready to catch up or to learn quick, quickly enough, even though they knew they had to learn, but not quickly enough to adjust to it. And even when they were learning, they found that they were learning under those very skillful uh, capitalists who were running the economy off the coast and pushing into the interior, up the rivers, step by step over the whole century. So that was number two. The third one, I. I don't want to emphasize too much on, but that is the, the simple fact that the, for the first time, the, the, for the first time in centuries, they saw the importance of the sea. The Chinese had a great navy. Everybody talks about it now. Admiral Zheng He in the 16th, 15th century, how remarkable that was. Indeed, it was, but it was really an aberration, and it, it, it didn't last very long. At most, 30 years and the whole, all the whole fleets were destroyed after that, and the Chinese never had a navy after that. When the British Navy turned up, as it were, all they could find were some coastal junks who were meant for defense against pirates, and no more than that. And for a very simple reason, the Chinese never bothered about the navy because for all their thousands of years of history, they never had any enemies come from the sea. And when you have no enemies coming from the sea, but all your enemies coming from land on the continental uh, people of the people of Turkic, Xiongnu, Turkic, Mongol, Jurchen, Manchu, Tibetan, all these people were attacking you on overland, uh, you didn't bother too much about the sea. The sea was, yes, open for trade, and other people took advantage of it, and the Chinese were allowed to trade too, but there was no threat to the system, so there was no need to spend too much money on it or spend too much time studying that. They discovered that in the 19th century and they wanted to learn. I won't go into to the long history of that, the efforts to learn, but the simple story was it was an absolute disaster. By the end of the century, they were defeated by the Japanese who very quickly adapted as an island nation, quickly adapted to maritime power and trained one of the best navies, uh, in fact, the best navy in Asia at the time, and probably still remains the best navy in Asia today. But uh, the, the fact was that the Chinese attempt to do it was slower. If you, look at, if you compare the rates, the Japanese learned much more quickly, not only just about navies, but the whole background of science and technology needed to make that navy what it was, and all the skills about mili modern, modern military warfare they picked it up from both the British on the one hand for the Navy and the Germans about the Army, whereas the Chinese didn't do that. They tried a little bit, they put in some money, they had a shipyard, they trained for a Navy, they bought a few ships and even tried to build a few. But when they met the Japanese at war in 1894, within a few weeks, the whole thing was, whole Navy was destroyed, totally destroyed. I, I, bring in this, bring in, I bring in this one because in the 20th century, this was what made China look even more helpless than it was. They didn't have a single ship worth talking about. They, made, they had a few ships they bought. They tried again and again. But by that time, the whole economy had been crushed by, the, by, by that century of, uh, of uh, losing control over the economy. As I said, some some economic historians have worked out that the Chinese were at the peak of their economic power apart from others.
at 1800 when he had something up to 30% of the world's economy was in China. Whereas by the same calculations, and I'm not sure about the exact the correctness of all this, but at, by the same calculations, by the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century, they were down to less than 5% of the world's economy. That's the steep decline in economic power. And without economy of your own that uh, can, can produce the resources to even think about in terms of a navy would be, was simply ridiculous. And they really never had the resources. And in any case, they couldn't do it because of other reasons. And that takes me to the second century of the, the second set of responses of a changing world. That first world was dominated by great powers, mainly Britain and France, and then followed by the Russians on land, and at the end of it all, the arrival of the Americans and the Japanese, but they were still very peripheral until the Japanese defeated them. So it was basically British, French, and Russian threats to China, two, two of them by sea and one of them overland. But in the case of the Britain, overland as well because the, the British and the, and, the, and the Russians fought over Central Asia and over Tibet and Xinjiang, and that posed a threat to the Qing Empire in a, in a way that they recognized. They saw that as a very serious threat, and as a result, they put a lot of resources, in fact, fighting against a rebellion, of the, the Muslim rebellion in, in Xinjiang, which they, sp they spent 10 years of enormous resources to try and suppress, because they were not, involved, not involving just the local Muslims, they were involving Muslims who were backed by Russians on the one hand and the British on the other coming up from Afghanistan. So that's a different story. Begin, the only point I want to make there is that they were caught by many things all at the same time. The world of 19th century was so different from the world of the 20th century. And yet, even as the world changed in the 20th century, they were in a worse position than they ever were for a long, long time. Probably the weakest position that China had, out, had been for the last maybe a thousand years, except the moments when they were <laughs> conquered by the Mongols or something. But then in, the, in Chinese history, the Mongols was accepted as part of their own history. They're conquerors and part of the conquest dynasty, so they're not, not too serious a problem. Whereas the, the present people are people from really outside of range of the Chinese civilization really threatening them. So the 20th century began in China, with China in the weakest position. But fortunately for China, in a funny sort of way, the rivalries of these great powers also grew more intense. The arrival of Japan as an imperial, a, a, a country with imperial ambitions, the arrival of Germans, very efficient, following their industrial revolution, uh, and threatening, as it were, British supremacy in, in this part of the world. The Russians, of course, not really all that strong, but they occupied so much land and dominated all the, the whole northern boundary borders of China. All these factors put even greater pressure on China. So that's something. But the fact that they were all fighting each other and rivals gave China an opportunity to survive. Because sometimes one is mystified how China could have survived as the way it has as a political entity inheriting the Qing Empire, more or less, with the exception of Mongolia, and of course, there's still the issue of Taiwan. But, but for the rest, they basically inherited the whole map of China as created by the Manchu Empire, in a, a map which was more or less at its peak at the, in, in the middle of the 18th century. But that it has survived on the, with, with that, roughly with that map is really quite uh, surprising given the fact that it was probably so weak that it's fortunate to have survived at all. Because if you look at the first 30 years of the 20th century, the Ch Qing Dynasty fell, the revolution led by Sun Yat-sen, there's no so-called national revolution, set up a republic that didn't work, ended up with warlords fighting each other for more than a decade, turned into a civil war between the Kuomintang and the communists for reasons one, one can go into, but I won't go into to, to tonight, but just to, to show that it was continual internal fighting, 
divisions among themselves, the divisions being exploited by all the powers around the neighborhood, neighborhood, either directly by arming the different warlords or by lending money to them so that they owed money to each of, each of them owed money to either the Japanese or the British or the Russians, and uh, using that, the money and the arms to fight each other during all that time. And even when the warlords, half the warlords anyway, were destroyed, the other half was still there, Kuomintang couldn't unify the country. Even when it was at least officially the inheritor of the the Qing, the, the, the Republic of China, and ended the era of the warlords and set up their capital, moved their capital from Beijing to Nanjing. Even then, when they were, they, uh, they were doing that, everybody knew they couldn't control the country. There were still lots of warlords around, and they found themselves uh, opposed by their fellow, once partners, the Communist Party, that they had been partners with against the warlords, now Turn again. They turn against one another, killing each other, fighting each other for the next few decades. For the next few decades, so all this period, right down to 1945, and followed then by the Japanese invasion. You are familiar with this. I won't go into it, but simply to say that those 50 years or so, from the f defeat by Japan in 1895 to the final victory against Japan in 1945 with the help of the Americans, rescued by the Americans, those 50 years were a period where the Chinese could well want to forget. What do you possibly have you to learn from that? But let me say that while that world was changing for China, it was also changing for the world outside, which benefited China. On the one hand, as I said, how they survived, the mystery is actually as simple as this. The rivalry between the various powers, nobody wanted anybody to control China. So as long as they were fighting each other, it gave them at least a chance to play in the world of dip diplomacy. And you do see some very able young diplomats emerging from the Chinese scene to try and play on their own weakness and the rivalries of the, all the powers that uh, were still dominant at the time. So there were a very good story would be someone like Sun Yat-sen, who started the revolution. What he did was, he, he, as he tried to overthrow the Qing dynasty, he, he, the British helped him to begin with, but the British didn't want the Qing dynasty to be overthrown. He turned to the Japanese, the Japanese were happy to help him because they wanted the Manchu Emperor, the Qing dynasty to fall, uh, so he, was, he moved to the Japanese. But when after the Qing actually fell, the Japanese didn't want the Qing Empire to survive because the Japanese, as many other great powers at the time thought, China was not a nation. All countries should be nations, nation states. And China was not, it was an empire. And when an empire fell, it should be broken up into the different nations. The dismemberment of China was actually taken for granted. It was only a matter of time. And the Japanese and the Russians took the lead. The Japanese in Manchuria, the Ma Russians in Mongolia, the British and the Russians fought over Xinjiang, which is why Xinjiang survived, because the, the two, uh, there was a kind of a standoff over there. And Tibet also survived largely because of that, because Britain wanted Tibet to be uh, free from Russian influence and therefore protected Tibet by using China as the suzerain state of Tibet in order, to, in order not to have to fight in Tibet, which would be pretty expensive and hopeless up in those highlands anyway. But as you can see, the dismemberment of China was expected. And the Japanese co concentrated on Manchuria, having already pushed into Korea. They'd taken Korea by 1910 as a colony, and they were pushing into Manchuria. So in that context, China survived because of the rivalries. All these powers wanted to prevent others from taking over. For example, the Americans were drawn in into Manchuria because they felt, together with the British, although the British were a little bit less certain, the Americans didn't want Manchuria to be in the hands of the Japanese or the Russians. They wanted to have an open door policy and all that. You can see that factor that helped to, for China to survive. So what were the lessons that the Chinese learned from that? Number one, very clearly, you need to be unified. 
If you fight continually among yourselves, you haven't got a chance whatsoever. So that was number one goal, and, and that was the purpose of uh, someone like Chiang Kai-shek and all the others. They were in no position to do it themselves in the face of Japanese invasion, but at the end of World War II, with the help of the Americans, and because Russian at that time had interest in, of a different kind, with the Soviet Union also agreeing, Chiang Kai-shek's China in 1945 more or less inherited, it, almost intact, except for Mongolia, almost intact, everything that the Manchu Qing Empire had built up in the 18th century. And that was quite remarkable. But the end of the story, of course, did not, was not there. Unfortunately for the Chinese, the Civil War continued, and to, I would say, to most people's surprise, the Chinese Communists won. Within four years of the end of Second World War, the communists had won. So we're now looking at the 20th century broken into two halves. The first half being one of total weakness and helplessness, I would say. And certainly nothing the Chinese could have done on their own could have saved them. But they were saved and were given a particular recognition by the United States, which was really quite surprising for most people, that in the setting up of the new world order of the post-World post War II world order with the United Nations, China found itself one of the five great powers of the world. Uh, I'm, I do not know what Chiang Kai-shek actually thought, but I think he thought uh, that was pretty much a miracle. And it, I think for the Chinese too, it was an amazing result of a war that they almost lost and probably had deserved to lose if it had been only with the Japanese as enemy. But anyway, that was the ending. But it was not a happy ending. Within five years, it was all over. And the communists had taken over. And then the Americans had been struggling for years now to prevent the communists from succeeding. First of all, not allowing it to become a member of the United Nations, blocking that for quite a while. Then failing which, trying other ways. And of course, in the middle of the Cold War, they finally realized that uh, the Chinese were not that fond of the Russians either, so there was an opportunity. Now, I, again, you know that probably better than I do. But what I want to say here is that here was China having a, a, different, a different start to this revolution. The Mao Zedong revolution that started in 1949 achieved, number one, the one thing most important to China, unification although not complete without Taiwan, but that's unification. And that unification brought more or less a peace to the borders of China for most of that time. There were no further real threats to China's borders from that time onwards. So unification was number one. Number two, Mao Zedong was quite determined to industrialize China. And he, he, he went, in fact, way out on a limb trying to do that and did some very stupid things like the Great Leap Forward and all the tremendous damage it did to the countryside, to the agrarian economy that China had inherited. And, uh, but he was in a, in a man in a hurry. He did all that. But that was a failure. So economically, he didn't make any progress, but he, he knew what China needed, industrialization. The one thing that he did introduce, which is extraordinary for a country that was real, basically very weak, and that was he, he was ambitious not to be dominated by the two great powers of the Cold War. He resented being dominated by the Russians, in fact more so because he, he really believed that the Americans would not dominate, would not try to dominate him or even try to influence his, his policies the way the Russians did. And in the case of the Soviet Union, the attempts to intervene in Chinese affairs was pretty obvious, helping them a lot, but nevertheless, that was true. I'm running out of time, sorry. <laughs> um, let me just end, end this part very quickly. If, if what, what we know happened, he basically failed. He succeeded in unification, he started industrialization, 
failed economically, then pushed out towards a kind of leadership separate from that of Russia and China by creating something in his mind was called the third world. I know that that word has been used by others, but in Mao Zedong's mind, this is much more important. That third world was something that China had a chance of leading against what he called the first world of the capitalist world and the second world of the Soviet imperialists in his mind. So that was something he, he knew. But I need hardly say he failed there as well. The fact that he failed, however, did not mean that China was weak. What happened was when Deng Xiaoping came back to power, he was able to build on what Mao Zedong had already established to move very rapidly to a new focus, an absolute priority for economic development by opening up China's economy as much as he thought was wise and continued to open up for the next 20, 30 years. And the results are fairly clear. We have seen now China move from the depths of poverty to a country that now, according to most, is number two, second largest economy in the world. It's still not a rich country, but it's certainly economically powerful when so much wealth is in one country that makes it very powerful. And the size, population, resources is extremely impressive. Very clear, we can talk about the right. China has risen. But the most important two things that I want to underline here, what they learned was that they have to learn everything they can from the outside world. Something that the Chinese, as I said, struggled with for the first 150 years or so, Deng Xiaoping did not. He asked his people to learn everything. And it is really remarkable how they have, in fact, learned everything. The, one, the things that they don't want to learn, they are quite clear about. They don't want to learn certain principles about governance, democracy, so the judicial system, the, the division of powers, and so and the, uh, uh, the, the uh, absolute uh, autonomy of the legal system. All these things, he wasn't uh, impressed. But it's not because he couldn't learn it, and it's not because it's the people of China couldn't learn it. The Chinese people are perfectly aware and have learned indeed, don't know exactly how it works. They have sent thousands of people abroad to study how every political system out there, as it were, works. They have watched the world change as it moved from the Cold War to the post-Cold War of the single superpower, the tremendous burdens of uh, being a sole superpower, the kind of things that led to troubles with globalization and doubts and about uncertainties of today. All these, you can take it that the Chinese have studied and followed very, very carefully. Whether they can do anything about it, that we, don't, we, we can't say for sure. But that you cannot fault them for the desire and the capacity to learn everything they can. But the two things that they still are building, I refer to one which is very obvious in our part of the world when we sit uh, as we're in the crossroads of uh, all these oceans, is the Chinese policies and attitudes towards the sea. Maritime trade has become the essence of their success. Without it, they could not have been where they are today. And a navy to protect their coasts and to defend their maritime trading and commercial interests, including the markets and resources that they would need, this has become an absolute priority for the Chinese. They're still building a navy, but what kind of navy, we are not sure. But I think this is the underlying thing, is it's, it's absolutely essential now that they understand the nature of the maritime global market economy that they have now joined. Secondly, and this is much more difficult, and that is the international law system. The rule of law principles of the international world order is, is something that the Chinese, it's not that the Chinese don't understand it, they do understand it now, they see it's, uh, it's uh, the, uh, for how it works. They have actually accepted most of it. If you follow what they've done in the United Nations and all the international organizations they've joined, they too have learned everything they want to know, how to make use of these organizations to profit themselves, that will benefit them, and they're very clear about what, they, what, what, they, what would be of benefit to them, what is in their national interest. 
But what they still have problems with it is because fundamentally they have a difficulty with the idea of the rule of law. I underline this because the Chinese do believe in law. They were legalists to start with. The whole imperial system was built by the legalists 2,000 years ago. And they have very powerful laws, and their laws are very harsh and very brutal. But they have one underlying principle. All laws are man-made, and the emperor who made the laws was above the law. Now that is a principle which cannot be accepted in the modern world today, and the Chinese are very uncertain and unwilling to abandon that. Because in effect, the Chinese Communist Party is a replacement for the emperor. It has all the rights of legitimacy of the emperor because emperors were, uh, and dynasties were created by victory in the battlefield, and they won in the battlefield hands down, total control, co more than ever, and they want to keep it that way, and they are not sure they need to change the fundamental idea behind the idea of law. So rule by law, they understand perfectly. Rule of law assumes a certain roots in natural law, which takes law, as it were, above us as human beings, ruler or subject, and that principle is something that the Chinese still have difficulty with. And this group, this distinction between rule by law and rule of law remains one of the most difficult ones now that the Chinese face today, and why it has, it has got itself into a position where many of the other things that they do quite well are also treated with suspicion and uh, uncertainty. I have to end because the, I cannot talk about the future, but I really want to say is that how much the burdens of history are there, the willingness to learn from history is there, the willingness to learn everything that they, they think is useful for their country is also there. This is the background of the China that I think we see, and so long as the world is changing, the China will watch it with great care, and they will adapt and change accordingly when they think they have to.